So pe people often ask me, what's Rob doing with a tank top? And one of the most amazing things in life today, nowadays, is the fact that we can talk from Ottawa to Costa Rica to California, where our guest is now living and uh, doing uh, some crazy adventures, which we're going to get into. And it's none other than Will Crockett, who's uh, well known by many, many, many in the industry uh well before we get into it i just want to give everybody a very quick sort of synopsis overview and maybe you could touch a little bit about the one question i always like to ask is what got you into photography we'll just dwell on that one for 20 seconds or more sure. so so will had a commercial photography studio he photographed for time newsweek united northwest midway american he photographed many celebs you know betty white tom bosley james coburn raymond burr etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, you, you've even photographed President Reagan, Carter, and Ford, and a bunch of senators as well, with many industrial clients. But the main thing that, uh, and I think this is possibly going to be one of the biggest uh, themes of this conversation that we're going to have, is the projects that you created, Shoot Smarter Namely, and the predictions that you've made, uh, which uh, I want to get into as well, because I'm going to ask you, for some predictions on the future. Okay, but let's get into that in a bit. <laughs> yeah, you guys are gonna find this very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Will's made some pretty big, so he's like, he's like, a, he's like a psychic, a, a photographic trend psychic uh, <laughs> kind of guy who can see things and probably beyond photography. So we'll get into that, so. He's like the Simpsons of the photography world. Yeah, that's right. There's a little bit of luck involved there too, but. I'll, I'll well, fill you in how I was be I was able to be correct on some of those rather big predictions, but all right, shoot, <laughs> give us a little synopsis of what got you into photography, and then we'll get into. I want to talk about how you pivoted in your career, sure. and then we'll lead up to uh, some of the principles that have to do with that, as well as oh, what you're sure. up to my, now. My, my dad had the sacred Nikon that he brought back from the war that no one in the house could touch. Right. The day when I was 13, I just decided I was going to sneak in there and go get it and started playing <laughs> with this beautiful Nikon FTN with a 51.2 on it. And there was just something about trying to figure out how to get a really good picture out of that thing. Mm -hmm. So I turned into getting my own camera and uh, dark room. Next thing you know, uh, I'm 15 years old and my mom is driving me around to photograph weddings in her Ford <laughs> station wagon. <laughs> you know, a lot of photographers have that same story. And uh, it kind of got in my blood. Uh, something weird got in the way. I was, I was really good with math and science, and uh, no one from my family had ever gone to college. Well, I won a scholarship to the University of Illinois to go study engineering. And wow. I, made it about, uh, yeah, um, I made it about two weeks into committing to that goal and just decided photography was it. So I packed up my Volkswagen van and I headed out to California. I went to Brooks there, which which is now defunct. I don't know if I had anything to do with that or not, but um, studied photography. And wouldn't you know, the first day after leaving school, I got a job as a photographer, and it just took off from there. Nice. This is all in the Chicago, Illinois area? Yeah, yeah. Central Illinois, a little town called Peru, Illinois, mm -hmm. was, was where I was at. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, you know, my first trip as going to college turned out to be Santa Barbara, California, which you can't get nicer than that, right? 
No. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I'm amazed that you were 15 shooting weddings. I mean, what kind of 15 year old has the balls, the guts, and the determination? Exactly. To say? Uh, I don't know if it's balls or stupidity. It's uh, it's somewhere in between the two. Mm -hmm. I just saw how bad some of these local photographers were, and I I thought I could do that. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to challenge myself to give it a shot. Uh, neighbor said, "Hey, uh, we can't afford a photographer. Can you take some pictures?" Okay. For some reason, they turned out great. And next thing you know, I had people just asking me, "Oh, can you do this? Can you do that?" And yeah. for a 15, 16 year old at the time making two hundred and fifty dollars, that was a lot of money. That's a lot of sure money. Sure, it is. Yeah. Poor <laughs> kid on the farm. We had no money when I grew up whatsoever. So same here. Um, it was enough to collect up and then go to go to college. I paid for my own college. That's amazing. So very that's cool. quite that's quite the thought to think when you're 15. That's very insightful. I would have been miles away from that. Oh, thanks. Myself. I mean, geez. But I think what I'm hearing too, and this is part and parcel what is pretty much an overreaching theme with you, is the fact that you were ambitious and motivated, call it brains, call it luck, call it balls, call it stupidity, call it whatever. The fact that you had that going for you. And I see it like, you know, I've known you for decades and I've yeah. watched you and followed you to like so many others. Uh, heck, I used to write for the blog, the Shoot Smarter blog back That's in the right. day. And a good job <laughs> too. Yeah, th that was uh, an amazing time. So, but yeah, so that got you into, uh, into uh, this amazing career that you started and successfully ran for our decades and decades and decades. Uh, and what I'm pointing out is that it was underscored by your ambition and your drive. But you must have been good at taking photographs. You must have had that visual acuity and ability to say, I can take that and create yeah, something. Yeah, I, I think you boil it down. It's all pro photographers at, at, at our level. We get an idea in our mind and we have the skills to put it onto a piece of paper or a, a screen. It's just that trip from point A to point B. They go, I got a great idea. Mm -hmm. Here's what I need to do, and here's my result. Mm -hmm. After you practice that, that gets easier and easier and easier. And mm -hmm. when you shoot for magazines, that's what they want. Yeah. They hire you because of that specific look, and then they give you an assignment, and they expect that look. And if you don't yeah. get that look, you don't get another job. So you developed that look, which we'll call a brand or whatever, early on. I did, yeah. Um, a lot of America was still using hard lights in the 80s. Right. I was the first one to take big, soft light on location. <laughs> the equipment gave us the ability to check. I, I was based in Chicago, so we could check Speedatron packs, then Allen Chrome packs onto yep. airplanes and travel with five foot light sources to get nice. that beautiful soft light in environments that you wouldn't expect them. And mm -hmm. that coupled with the fact that I explored the Fuji transparency films, one of the first photographers in America to actually jump on to the look of those, then figure out how to manipulate the color of those transparency films to get something that they'd never seen before. Amazing. So it was a combination mm -hmm. of, uh, I was able to figure out the film and to get it to sing and doing something completely different that you know, there's a lot of luck involved, Rob. <laughs> Get it to sing. I'm going to disagree with you on that one. I think you had the ability, like when you say point A to point B and you see an image and you're able to create something from it, I still am learning that. I'm miles away from that. And I know many, many photographers have that ability. And I'm like, yeah. And I know many photographers who have that ability, but they make no money because they're pig headed in other areas. That's true. That's to so me, true. To me, you got the perfect storm of that. And you've got the business savvy. So, oh, thank you. you know, whatever that is combined is a very powerful force. And I think it's rarer than it is commoner because so many photographers and some are like really, really good, but they just can't. There's no legs behind the business side and they sort of flounder in that area. Oh, yeah. I, I see so many photographers that are way more talented than I ever was who struggle financially their entire lives and if they mm -hmm. can find that right business partner mm -hmm. and be able to work with them of course which is the other part of that equation that they they would they'd be doing great so what do you, what would you tell them if and or if you could go back to the 80s and you know you saw people like that what would you what advice would you give them as far as trying to develop you said something earlier that you just keep practicing you develop that skill which mm -hmm. is a solid piece of advice for anybody wanting to know the technical and master the technical side, but yeah. on the business side, 
Yeah, you know, uh, I could go back to the great Mark Hauser. Mark was a dear friend of mine. Mark love, always love had Mark. problems. It was it was widely known. Um, I ran Mark's studio right at the end there for him for mm -hmm. multiple reasons. But one was basically just to show him that I can be in his space. I am not Mark Hauser. I can't shoot the way Mark can. I can get mm -hmm. close depending on what it is, but I'm not him. But I showed him how we can generate ten thousand dollars a day in that studio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it was actually easy because there was such a high demand for his work. Yep. Yet he had no idea how to be efficient. He was spending three hours on a photo session that should have consumed only thirty minutes of his time. So I came in there and actually dropped in two sets, and we kept Mark rotating from set A to set B, and gave him a, a staff. And it was really easy to generate those kind of dollars. So I think that if photographers just team up with a, a class or some sort of educational system that shows you just basically how to run a business and how to balance a balance sheet, mm -hmm. it all becomes really easy. I, I don't understand why it's that difficult other than maybe photographers getting in their own way, which I'm, I'm definitely guilty of. Yeah, I'm guilty of it for sure. So I remember you talking or Mark Hauser, and I, I love, I freaking love Mark Hauser. Uh, John, can you go to the Shoot Smarter YouTube page? And I'm sure there's some Mark Hauser videos on there. Maybe we can, uh, if you can do a quick search. But I remember him talking, I, I, he had a DVD out and I bought it and it was like an hour long, but it was pure gold. Were you behind that? And were you behind, I know he did a, a big, promotion once where he did a session and it was like i think it was a fundraiser and it was hugely successful was that was that you it was it was us mark had a problem with addiction his entire life right and i am an anti-drug kind of guy uh -huh. I, if i ever found my employees even with a joint for after work they would they would be sent to the door that's just they knew the rules yeah but when my seminar tour took off mark was at the middle of the swing of one of his pendulum uh, moments. Right. And he came up and said, you know, Will, why can't I have a seminar like yours? You know, you're doing great with this. Well, how, how can we do it? So I said, I tell you what, you get clean for two years and come back. And I'll put you a seminar together. <laughs> two years to the day, he calls up, you know, you remember Mark's voice, right? I do a good house impersonation. Hey, Crockett. I told you two years and I give you a call and now I'm calling. You're going to have to deliver on the promise, which was that we, we were going to make a seminar tour for him. So I made uh -huh. a couple of calls and the sponsors were, were warm to the idea, but they were relying yeah. on me to tell them that he was really sober. Mm -hmm. so the first project we did to prove to the sponsors that he was ready to go was that video, the um, DVD, uh, what, uh, Bold and Simple, The Light yep. of Mark Hauser, which is available on YouTube for free if you like it. It's to free. Is it on that same one? Yeah. You got to find okay. it, John. And we got to post yeah, it. Look for it. Bold and Simple Mark Hauser. It should pop up on YouTube somewhere there. Okay. Because I did find one where it was a, a day in the studio of Mark Hauser. This is good. Yeah. I produced that one be way before Mark had his little fall off the, off the wagon. When... Anyway, so Mark... Mark proved he was ready to go. And of course, this is a classic case. Uh, we gave him three dates and there you go. We gave him three dates and he had a catastrophe on date number two and number three. And he, oh he no. Lost. Yeah. Oh, did he but, fall off the wagon? No, no. He just uh, wasn't being treated the way he wanted to. I think it had something to do with the ASMP guys did something uh -huh. that's rattle his cage and he just couldn't pull out of a tailspin yeah mark, mark god bless him had such immense talents but he also had this immense ego oh, okay unless he thought you were a photographer at his level he didn't quite give you the same level of respect okay somehow he he let me into that club i don't know if i quite belong in there but <laughs> mark and I oh, yeah. brothers oh, yeah. and uh, there's mark right there you know i miss the crazy guy he he i never got that what you just described i've met people like that but i never got that vibe from him and uh i remember in one of his videos he said i i don't understand why people don't get this it's so simple basically he uses one light but he creates this amazing yeah. look yeah 
Yeah. And you he's probably have more insight than anyone else. He, he truly is a master, and he will go down in history as one of America's greatest black and white portrait photographers. Top, top 10, no doubt. Yeah, he's just one light. It's off to the left side because he's left-handed. Seriously. Anytime you, see, anytime you ever see a shot with Mark, it's lit from the right. They flop the neg. <laughs> Yeah, because he will only shoot from one side. See, I'm the same way. I always try and do it from the left, and it's no reason except for when I read a book, I leave from left to right, <laughs> and I've always done that. So that's how I've always done that. I don't know. Yeah. It's just yeah, it's funny. weird. It's funny. So there's no there's no real magic, other than he was able to create something. And uh... oh yeah, from the get go, he he made his first million dollars when he was 22 years old. Wow. Really. He died basically broke, and I no can't kidding. how much he made in between, but it was a hell of a lot more than that. How did he make his first million in photography? Yeah, yeah, he ended up at 18 years old, got an assignment from Playboy magazine, mm -hmm. and because it was so different looking, it was the Barnum mm -hmm. Bailey Circus, and he did this beautiful side light of the clowns and right. the ballerinas. Wow, the images were crazy. And they just got viewed, and next thing you know, he got a big ad campaign, and uh, then it mm -hmm. just went, went on from there. He, he he was he was booked solid for five years. Wow! Know? Yeah. Wow! Unbelievable. I did not know that. Uh, it's interesting. I find that kind of stuff very very fascinating uh, for many many reasons. It can it can help us. It can uh, we can learn from it, and uh, we can learn what not to do. Not to do. Sometimes that helps. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing, and it's I think of guys like him, and I don't want to dwell on uh, Mark too too much, but I think it's. It's such a valuable topic. So well, it, it was, and if you recall, when we were running Shoot Smarter University, mm -hmm. we would have Mark twice a year there, mm -hmm. and we could handle forty students was max capacity, and we would have people show up the first day of class, knowing that the class was full. It was it would sell out minutes when we put it up on available, and we're talking about two thousand dollars per person to spend a week with Mark Hauser. Unbelievable. There would be people show up assuming they could just get in the door yeah. that registered that would offer cash to my assistants to bribe them to come in. And just <laughs> that, that, that's how that's how terrific that class with Mark was. It was. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's an interesting, interesting thing that guys like him are so good. Yeah. And but yet so ridiculously simple, and you you want to get into their brains and go, what is it? What yeah. I want some of that, and yeah. like, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, it was it's it a was, gift. Was, oh yeah, I I learned so much from Mark. Just the the whole vision thing, because my communication skills are part of what really helped me get along. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I I shot a lot for Time Magazine, they would give me the the knuckleheads. Like if you had a uh, CEO, for instance, that right. gave a hard time to the editor or to a previous time photographer, they'd send Crockett. <laughs> we'd show up in a suit and a tie, literally. We'd show up in a suit and a tie, uh, two assistants, and we'd tell them, you know, we need 90 minutes to set up, and then I need 11.6 minutes for the first session and 6.4 minutes for the second session. We'd really tell them that. That's Just, communication. Yeah. And they'd, they'd hold me to it. They'd get the watch. Boy, we could nail it. <laughs> but they liked that because they didn't want their time messed with. And they wanted yeah. somebody that would could just chop right through in linear progression. And that's kind of what uh -huh. we brought to the table. Hmm. Is the opposite of Mark Hauser. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you have Hauser time when you're in front of Mark's lens. Hauser, uh, I'm sure he was grateful to have had a friend like you and somebody in his life to try and keep him on... Uh, on the uh, the best path possible. I mean, I'm sure he was addicted to drugs. It doesn't matter what, but he was addicted to something, and you were the complete opposite. So you kind of balanced mm -hmm. each other out in exactly. that respect. Yeah. So fascinating, yeah. fascinating. It's too bad he's gone. And uh, it is. We lost him too soon. Yeah. I encourage anybody go watch that video. You will not regret it. It is so amazing. But. Well, yeah. I want to talk about something I think is really, really important, and it came up in the email I sent out yesterday to promote this uh, live stream. Sure. I think of Will Crockett, I think of somebody who knows how to pivot. Yeah. So that's like your superpower. 
other than the fact that you have this ability to create images and you also have an entrepreneurial drive. But pivoting is the process that just blows me away. And I've pivoted in my studio multiple times, not knowing I was. Yeah. You know, but I now can see it clear as day. And I don't know anybody who has pivoted more than you. I mean, Mark Hauser sort of pivoted, but with your help. Because you're probably the pivoter of pivoters. And uh, let's go back in time to your first, there's probably others, but your first big pivot when you had your motorcycle accident. Maybe we can talk about that. Oh, yeah, good. That's a great story. Yeah, 2003, mm -hmm. I was right in the middle of uh, my, my biggest seminar tour. We uh, had a semi-truck worth of equipment that would go city to city. It was very successful. My shooting calendar was full. We had 12 employees. And Mr. Knucklehead here takes the family on vacation, comes back, wasn't fully rested from the flight, hops on a motorcycle, and at about four o'clock in the morning, just about kills himself on the two wheels. Jeez. Yeah, so 14 broken bones. I was unconscious for maybe 90 minutes. I get the helicopter ride, the whole thing to the emergency. And the first thing I remember at the hospital is, Mr. Crockett, we need your consent to cut both your legs off. Oh, jeez. <laughs> So I go, yeah, that's that's probably not where we're, we're going to go. So I got my wife on the phone and she, she popped in the car. I was maybe four hours away. She ran in there and they kept me stable at the hospital. And uh, they flew another doctor in and the doctor said, look, we're not going to cut both legs off. We're going to fix this one. But the one that's really smashed up. We got to decide, are we going to cut it off and put a robotic leg on there? Or do you want to try to rebuild it? Mm -hmm. said, well, what's the difference? He said, well, the rebuild's going to take two years. The robot's going to take six months and you're back up on your feet. So uh, I asked him what he would do. And he said, I would rebuild. So I go, well, let's rebuild. So mm -hmm. off we go. Uh, now, to this day, by the way, I still have some issues that I'm, I'm getting surgically repaired. Mm -hmm. So I've had 23 surgeries, believe it Ouch. or not. Wow. But the first pivot that you refer to is really kind of funny. And during the recovery, after probably about nine months, I was in a wheelchair for a uh, well, better part of two years. Wow. Starting to learn to walk again. But because as fragile as the, the, the replacement parts in my left leg and hip were, everything was replaced, that they needed me to stand, but I couldn't walk. So Crockett says, I need to get a Segway. Because that way I can go back on my speaking tour. I can't shoot with a Segway, but I can't shoot from a uh, uh, wheelchair either. So I could continue my speaking tour. So that's exactly what they did. My insurance company bought me a Segway. We put this huge ADA plaque, you know, a wheelchair plaque on the front of it because it was legal. And no one could refuse me. So my second gig, it's working out great, right? My second gig, I'm in Las Vegas speaking at a huge convention for high volume printers. And uh, flew in the day before, get into the MGM Grand Hotel, and here come the police. Crockett gets arrested for having a Segway inside a casino. I, oh, yeah. I'm trying to explain to them. I go, no, this, this isn't a gas. I look like I'm a normal guy, but I can't walk. So I showed them the kind of funny parts that I had hanging out of my leg there to adjust all the stuff. And the cop was kind of confused. So wouldn't you know, the, the, literally the CEO, Mr. Diller, I believe his name was, ended up coming downstairs and having a talk with me and said, you know, how are we going to get out of this? You know what they did? They assigned policemen to me 24 hours a day to wow. get people out of the way because their biggest fear was they didn't want me running over people's toes in the casino and getting sued. So you remember in those mafia movies where the guy sits out your hotel room right in the chair? I mm -hmm. had that really kind of cool. <laughs> but <laughs> but I went back right down there. <laughs> And I'm speaking and there's cops over there and people are wondering, you know, what the hell's going on with Crockett? He's got police following him now, right? Mm -hmm. So pivoting in that in that sense was was a lot easier for me. I know a lot of people look at it like it was some monumental task, but it really wasn't. Because we have to realize, even though I could not shoot commercial assignments because I didn't have legs and the wheelchair wouldn't work, uh -huh. I did have my speaking tour which was very profitable. And I had the educational facility, Shoot Smarter University, which was a 6,000 square foot four day studio in Chicago that we would bring in photographers to teach four day, five day classes. Mm -hmm. So I could manage that. So I still had an income. I still had the ability to keep my, well, we, we scaled down to 10, 
but to keep my employees working while I'm in recovery for two years. I mean, that's pretty yeah. tough to be out of work mm-hmm. for two years. So I was, I was really lucky to have diversified early to have three different routes of income. And I never wanted to be away from shooting because that, that's what kept everything going. The, the jet fuel in that engine was the fact that I was making images that you would see on TV Guide and, and Time Magazine. That was what got people to the seminar because they wanted to see, oh, you know, I remember seeing that picture on an ad on a billboard. That's mm. the guy that photographed it. I want to see how he did that. Yeah. And that was always the impetus of getting people in. And we wanted to educate them. And if they felt they got their money's worth, because everything we did was fully guaranteed. If you bought that DVD from your local camera store, what's that big camera store up in Toronto? Uh, there's a Henry's and there's VizTech. VizTech. Are they still around? They're still there. God bless. Yep. <laughs> they used to sell a, just a boatload of our videos. If you bought it and you were unhappy with it, you didn't learn what was on that DVD, you would mail it back to us and we would pay. Even though the camera store sold it, yep. we would stand behind it and send the check back to the person. I think I ordered my CD or DVD right from the Will Crockett Shoot Smarter thing one time. It came right in the mail. And fully guaranteed, just like our classes. If you got through a four-day class, you got through to the end of day two, we would give you all your money back and typically take you to the airport and probably pay for your ticket to get back home too. Because we knew our content was that good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess you had very, very few, if any, refund requests. We had very little for the hundreds of, well, almost a little over 100,000 DVDs we sold. I'll bet you we had maybe two dozen come back. Okay. But we, we assume those people were ones that intended to do it anyway. You know, there's always yeah. that person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the weasels. Yeah. yeah. They're the ones that copy it and put it on the internet, too. Yeah. <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. So that was the first big pivot. And I'm assuming you want, to, you want to talk about a couple of the other ones. I want to ask you about that first pivot first, yeah. and in the in the sense that you were down and out, and obviously the circumstances forced you to obviously find a solution, yeah, and rely on one of the or several of the uh, sources of income. Yeah, one or two of them went away, but out of that too, did you create a new? product a new reinvented uh source of income sort of tied to the original but you know the way we do weddings in my studio but now we do pop-up weddings my wife is a wedding officiant so we've taken wedding photography now we do pop-up weddings wow that's cool i didn't know that three yeah. years ago we started and it's just been amazing and it it goes with the trends that are very popular especially with the millennials and second weddings so we're staying very uh, very relevant. Wow. So it, what specifically would have happened maybe vis-a-vis uh, Shoot Smarter and or otherwise that came out of that adverse set of circumstances? Yeah, yeah. There, there actually was one that, uh, that, that really kind of turned my career in a completely different direction. I didn't know that there were photo consultants in the industry that mm-hmm. would be hired kind of in the background mm-hmm. to help develop products. And I ended up building a, a very strong relationship with Fuji Film was my mm-hmm. first big sponsor. Mm-hmm. They were super happy with the, the seminars I did in the film era. Mm-hmm. Then because I was such a computer guy and a tech guy, right? And I was going to school for engineering for goodness sakes. Mm-hmm. I was the guy to help them with digital when it first came on the scene. All right. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of clatter and misinformation about digital when it happened. Mm-hmm. But because of my engineering background, Fuji gave me access to their tech lab in Los Angeles. And I met a whole group of scientists and engineers that oh. were trying to figure out, hey, how are we still going to sell film? But we need to have a digital camera that replicates what film can't do and will eventually replace the film. Mm -hmm. That was was massive. So from my hospital bed, I get this phone call from Fuji saying, hey, we got this super secret project. We want to key in. Super secret. (laughs) Yeah. So I I was introduced to the world of NDAs, which, of course, have 
sabers and fangs on them to say, if you spill yeah. the beans, you're going to be in huge trouble. Yeah. So I completely understood that and it didn't bother me, mm -hmm. but I started my career as a consultant. And mm -hmm. once you kind of work with somebody big like Fujifilm and word gets out, the smaller companies were jumping in there. And if you recall, I did a lot of work with Quantum. I did a lot of work mm -hmm. with Chrome, uh, mm -hmm. even a little bit with Profoto and, of course, Sekonic. I did. I love my work with Sekonic. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, uh, it was the, the last contract I had, which was with Panasonic, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit later, that was, that was the monster. That was the one that really set me on my way. Okay. But it was really nice to be able to to go into another route of making money when I couldn't. So, in fact, my consulting business paid more than what my photo business did, and I was mm -hmm. I was doing really well. When you get a couple covers for Time Magazine, there's some there's some big dollars to be made with your camera. Definitely. But I I actually somehow, man, I got lucky. I fell off a motorcycle just mm -hmm. about died two years mm -hmm. in a wheelchair, and I was making twice the money that I did. Before, before. <laughs> so do you, guess, yeah, do you think that would have happened had you not had the motorcycle? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, no. so I, I always say things happen for a reason sometimes, and maybe yeah. that was not that we wanted you to have a motorcycle accident, but right. I mean, you know, I wonder about that too. I'm not the uh, I'm not the super spiritual guy, but I am a I am a spiritual guy in some sense. Yep. yep. But I think there's an absolute reason why I was knocked back down because all of that happened for all the right reasons. So mm -hmm. all happened for all the right reasons. <laughs> yep. I freaking love it. That's amazing. So yep. all right, what was your next big pivot? The next big pivot was the first war I was involved in. The, when digital came across, we had the Ebsen and Adobe team, which were mm -hmm. fully funded, and they had these great photographers in there. But unfortunately, they fed them with this ugly misinformation that didn't make any sense. And on the other side, you had me. And I was standing up for shooting. We're going to make money with this. And the labs were all behind me, right? Both the Kodak and the Fuji labs. They go, Will, can you please tell photographers how to shoot in JPEG? We know they're not as good as RAW, but can you teach them how to shoot in JPEG? Can you teach them what custom white balance is? Can you teach them to use the sRGB space mm -hmm. and just send us the files and we'll fix them? Don't murder files in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. So Fuji sunk a ton of money. I am not kidding you. A ton of money mm -hmm. into my second seminar tour, which did that. It was right. five points. Here's what a monitor profiling looks like. And the, Fuji did the coolest thing, even though it cost them an arm and a leg. We travel with a semi truck mm -hmm. with a, my whole studio. And the first thing we did in that show was set up my typical four light corporate portrait headshot. So it's all mm -hmm. the light two meters. Mm -hmm. Set up one Fuji camera tethered to a laptop, then tethered to an Epson inkjet printer, a big 24 inch inkjet printer. And I took one picture when it was all done, just click perfect exposure, didn't do anything, took the JPEG. Ran it into image print at the time, printed it up, and then we took our first break. And I go, this is the workflow of the future. Mm -hmm. Let the camera do all the work. You just have to have the skills to let the camera have all the information it needs to make mm -hmm. this print. And I said, at the break, please come up and take a look at this 24 by 38 print. Tell me what's wrong with it. Well, of course, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> basic, perfectly exposed, four light headshot. And people got the message. Yeah. So that's why they put us on the tour for three years. And I don't know if they, I'm, I'm assuming long run, they made money on the tour, but the budget for it was crazy. Yep. And it turned a lot of photographers around. When I yeah. go to PPA and WPPI conferences right now, I get people whom I don't recognize come up and thank me for showing them that to say, look, I understand you can make money with a JPEG. It's not perfect. No. Nope. And wow, it certainly is a lot better, but you can still make money with it. And that's the key. You got to be able to make money with it. Well, I think Rob is 100% JPEG all the time. I Rod. keep trying raw once in a while, but I go back to JPEG. I've been preaching the same thing. I, you know, I, I used to say this a bit of a smart ass comment, but I'd say when I go to the bank and I deposit that weekly sales bundle of checks and cash, the yeah. teller doesn't say, Did you shoot these in JPEG or raw? <laughs> 
Clients don't ask. <laughs> they don't care. Money is no. money. They, they don't care. care. They just want that final image, and they don't care how you got it. They don't care. Uh, I, I was a I power. If you work on your skills and you understand how to use a camera and you mm -hmm. get the idea of balancing color, just let the camera do its thing. I mean, even back then, that was a Fuji S1 camera mm -hmm. that we were making these big prints off of JPEG. And people of said course. it was impossible. You know, in fact, there were some folks that would come see that show and they go back to those little squirrel forums online and they would say that I was tricking them, that there's no way what I did was possible. Yep. Yeah. I remember, though, if I'm not mistaken, those cameras, too, they used Nikon lenses, if I'm not mistaken. They Wasn't did. it a Nikon mount? Yeah, they Fuji didn't have a lens. They just used no. Nikon lens. Yeah. You're going way back in time here. This is early, <laughs> early 2000s. Right? When right? is this? So I, I got hammered so much by my peers for the sRGB JPEG thing yeah. that still to this day, there's kind of chicken bones in my throat when I see a couple <laughs> of people floating around. Yep. Because I, I knew I had the power of Fujifilm and Kodak and all of America's labs behind me. Mm -hmm. yep. I said, yeah, Will's the right way. That's this, this try this. So I knew that I was going to win, but boy, I tried to be nice about it. But man, I got to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's crazy, eh? Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, you know, somebody's got a, the pioneers always get shot up with arrows. That's just yeah. the way it is. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's the way it is. So. Some survive, some don't. So we're glad you were there to bring the message home. And obviously you were right. So there's exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. And he, and he was a pioneer too. And it came to, uh, I don't know if we'll get to this after, but the hybrid situation there too. Yeah. Let's go there. One of the, pi yeah. one of the pioneers of that. He sure. predicted, predicted that. I did. I can now tell the story because my NDA has expired. <laughs> I was, uh, nobody knew anything about mirrorless. Mirrorless was not even a word yet. So I get called by Panasonic for a consulting contract, send over this huge NDA that I, I, I took at least a week for my lawyer to go through it. it had made some changes, sent it back. I, I don't know what they were asking me to do, but it was super important. They fly me out to New York City, believe it or not, with my uh, the, my marketing guy, Tom Curley. Hi, Tom, if you're watching. And we sit down and they say, we're going to show you something that you're either going to think is stupid or huh? it's going to blow your mind. And I go, I love it, right? <laughs> Here they come out with the first mirrorless camera that they ever made. And it, wow. it looked like a Lumix GH3. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they handed it to me and I'm looking at it and I'm trying to figure it out. I said, no, don't say anything. Let me, let me see if I can figure this out. So I'm looking at the EVF and I'm thinking, ah, oh, EVFs at the time, EVS thing. We don't want to do EVFs. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Turn it on. So I turned it on and I looked in there and I go, oh, you figured out EVFs. So for those who are curious, EVS stands for? Electronic Viewfinder. As pros, we were so resistant to looking through an electronic finder because they were awful. Mm -hmm. We wanted a DSLR, right? We wanted that mirror and that prism so we could look through the lens and see things in real life. But the whole idea of mirrorless comes into play when a guy like me or a guy like Mark Hauser shoots in black and white. Mm -hmm. If I can look on the viewfinder and I can see my image in black and white, I can create my lighting better. I can mm -hmm. adjust my contrast better. Mm -hmm. I can change my light because I want a little bit harder fill light because I'm seeing my final image in black and white. Yeah. That was the moment that I had the head explosion. I go, this is the coolest thing. And they said, wait, it gets better. <laughs> Try the video button. So they've got TV screens all over the place. They hand me an HDMI cable. So I plug it into the side of this camera and I'm seeing the live EVF, which is unbelievable quality. Mm -hmm. Then I'm able to shoot video, play video like this. This is exactly the camera I would invent. If you said, <laughs> Will, would you like to make your own camera? That's what it would be. Right. Oh, I go, okay, how good is the quality of it? And they said, well, you know, this is the first sensor. This isn't going to be our final sensor. Give it a try. So I go, well, I, I need some light. So they open up a curtain and there's a bunch of light. I go, great, I'll be over there. <laughs> So I'm like a kid in a big old toy box and they don't even know what this stuff is. I go, yeah, I need one of those, one of these, one of these. I put it together and I go, this is going to revolutionize photography. So then they say, Will, would you please join our team and help us design this camera, finish it up, 
help with the menus, make it more user friendly, then mm. would you help us hire photographers to be on the first Panasonic Lumix speaking team and then mm. with the coach and teach them how this camera works from a photographer's perspective? So I go, heck yeah, I was going to do it for free. Then mm. I saw what they were going to pay me and I couldn't believe it. It was like a dream come <laughs> true. I'm kind of pinching myself to see if I'm dead. So, <laughs> I left that day with five or six of their cameras, one that was not in production. And in fact, um, if we ended up taking a break, I wish I would have known we were going to talk about this. I have the first Lumix GH4 that was ever released out of the factory. It doesn't even have the word Lumix up on the top of it. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I still have it with me. And in fact, I still shoot with it just for the hell of it to see how long a prototype would last. Yeah, that's amazing. So well, that was another pivot into consulting on a completely different level. I totally enjoyed it. I ended up being the uh, the speaker to launch at CES, which was a kind of a milestone for me. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, that's it, that's what got me on television. I did a bunch of TV spots and radio spots, and it was all mm -hmm. because of the Panasonic stuff. Really? Yeah. That's, a, that's really cool. Um. And I still okay. shoot fearless, but I don't shoot Lumix all the time. I shoot Fuji too. I, uh, There's a GH4. So imagine a camera that doesn't have the word Lumix on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the surface is a little bit different. That's what the first prototype looks like. And it's nice. in, my, uh, in my studio room. <laughs> cool. Piece yeah. of history. Yeah, piece of history. Yeah, That's amazing. So, yeah. um, all right. So... Um, I got like 18 questions all <laughs> attacking me from different sides, but I want to, I want to stick to pivot a bit more because sure. this, this is really the theme. And yep. we're talking about how these camera companies pivoted, how your career pivoted, your business pivoted. And, uh, Tony Shrek's asking you a question. I don't know if you want to answer it. Can you see it? Tony. Oh, hi, Tony. There's a terrific photographer in Minneapolis, a good friend of mine. Uh, terrific instructor, by the way. Uh, you should have him on your show someday. He's a great guy. Thanks What's for that, it? Tony. We're after you now. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Says great content, awesome stories. Always a blast to hear Will speak. Will is in the is the Congo blue on the background behind you. Yes, of course it is. Now that is a little inside baseball joke. All right. Um, part of the look of my photography early on came from using gels. I would take my main light and I would lower its color temperature, meaning make it warmer by about 400 degrees Kelvin. I'd leave okay. my, my fill light neutral. And then I would take my my hat, my backlight, and I would typically raise the color temperature. This this actually is, is Congo blue. It's not a color temperature. Okay. But that was my look. So when you saw those headshots that had a warm main light, a neutral fill, and a blue kicker, that was a Will Crockett lighting. So cool. So go ahead. You You'd warm up the main light. You would adjust the actual output to warm it up to get that yeah. result. Yeah, using a gel, you know, a sheet of plastic that's yeah. colored. Yeah. Well, well we the commercial the photographers used a lot of gels, didn't they? So this was very much something you were accustomed to. Oh, yeah, all the time. So yeah. as I would bring in other photographers into my world there, they were fascinated with the fact that I had at least 60 different gels in stock. So I could mm -hmm. grab whatever I needed to. And it's kind of funny because Tony knew that that particular color happens to be Congo blue. So that's, <laughs> that's, a, little, that's a little jab at Crockett, which is well, well appreciated. Um, before we get back onto the pivoting, I got to ask you a quick technical question. If somebody wanted to replicate that, what you just described with the gel, could they not adjust the in camera, adjust the, uh, the, the white balance? If you were shooting, you know, adjusting the Kelvin scale, not shooting raw, just shooting JPEG, right? You know, which is how I shoot. I have my Kelvin set to daylight, and I never change it. I just right. shoot everything like that. I just I get what I get, just like in the film days. Yeah. Um, could you not adjust it up or down to make it warmer? Well, if you were only using one light, you probably could. But my whole gig was when you looked at a boring corporate portrait, I needed mm -hmm. something to separate my work from everybody else's because. Mm -hmm. I was charging, you know, $2,500 a day to go shoot these gigs. Mm -hmm. And there were photographers that were $900 that could get it done, but they couldn't replicate my lighting. Right. So imagine I have a main light here and it's warm just a little bit. And then I use a fill light here that's neutral. 
but then the kicker light that's hitting me here is actually bluish. Right. And then my dot on the back could be super warm. Well, each one of those lights being different, when you put them all together, it's kind of like making spaghetti. You get that mm -hmm. little blend. That's right. great. Mm -hmm. And a lot of photographers would look at it and they didn't know how to do it, which was part of the draw of the seminar tours because that was the first shot we would show them. They right. Want, how the heck do you do that? The light looks warm, but it's cool over here. So we would show them how to do it. Yeah, it reminds me of Dean Collins. Yeah. Yes, Dean Collins was the master. He had me times 10 when it came to that stuff. <laughs> he uh, was very technical, Dean Collins. Yeah, yeah, he was terrific. That's where I learned. Specular and, and highlight and... It's used highlights, yeah. That's yeah. where I learned it from. That's right. And learned <laughs> how to, I learned how expensive a color meter was from Dean, too. <laughs> so let's roll into the future now. Yeah. Um, things changed for you. You went through some massive changes in your life. Maybe we can touch about that. Cause what I think you're doing is really, really cool. You're in a oh, sweet thanks. position. You're still the same. Will yep, still the same passion, the same. You're still driven, ambitious. And, and I want to ask you about predictions, but yeah. let's get into that in a minute. What have you been up to in the last bunch of years? Well, I retired from regular photo life back in 2016. Mm -hmm. Had a couple of contracts, one with the Navy, and I could pick any Navy base to work on. Wow. And I was able to finish up in Lemoore, California. A good friend of mine, Gar the Garcia Photo Studios there. So I got a chance to hang out with him, finish a little bit of work, then decided I want to move over to the coast. Come on over to the coast. I started a small photo business that would uh, give marketing content and social media content to the winery because I live in uh, central California, right on the water. And that is America's second largest wine producing sector. So uh, I built a nice little business, had a couple of photographers work in there. And of course, COVID hit and mm -hmm. that squashed the wine business. And it's not going to come back because we're still wearing masks here in California. Mm -hmm. So that business went away and COVID kind of rolled around and I'm thinking, man, I'd really like to shoot more portraits. So I ramped up my portrait business, but you know, I'm in a small spot. It's really sleepy. I'm trying to really promote that didn't make sense. I would have to move to Los Angeles or San Francisco in order to really shoot what I shoot. Mm -hmm. So I decided to th sit back and think about what were some of the fun things that I did that I'd like to do again. Well, back when we had the semi truck for our seminar tour and Shout out to Dave Malin if he's watching, Super Dave. Um, I was the backup truck driver because the insurance company needed it. We had a full-time driver. So uh, mm -hmm. our insurance company had to have a backup just in case. So they put me to truck driver school, and I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. Mm -hmm. So I drove the truck whenever I could, which is really weird because from New York to, to Los Angeles, you know, it takes you eight or nine days. But I did it. It was probably my vacation. So mm -hmm. COVID goes around, and I'm seeing this shortage of truck drivers. Then I talked to one of my buddies who moves collector cars. And he says, mm -hmm. Bill, do you know there's over a year's worth of European supercars on the water or stuck in L.A. Harbor because we can't get qualified truck drivers to get them out? I go, how hard is it? They said, no, it's really hard. You've got to take a Ferrari and drive it in a truck without scratching it, lock the wheels down right, with all those straps, and then you have to carefully drive it to the customer and then get it back out the door. And then you put eight of those Ferraris in one truck. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a challenge to me. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Over COVID, I go back to truck driving school in, in Fresno, nice. meet fabulous people, get my license, call my buddy back and say I'm ready to go. So Last week, I just finished my training, and if folks hop on my Facebook page, everybody's welcome. You can see that I moved some crazy show cars and collector cars. Uh, my route is from Los Angeles to Miami, and I have to make one lap every month to keep the company happy. So right. They bought this beautiful truck and this beautiful trailer. The company totally loves me. And, of course, I'm getting nice pictures for their website, too, and their promotional nice. stuff. Bonus. So I pivoted once, hopefully for my last time, not that I'm going to die in a fiery crash, but this will probably take me on to retirement for real uh -huh. uh, uh, because I enjoy the heck out of it. It is so much fun. Retirement for real. Yeah. I <laughs> doubt it. I doubt it. I don't know that retirement and Will Crockett <laughs> in a real sense is going to happen. I'm going to yeah. guess something else is going to evolve. It sounds like you're really enjoying 
how uh, can I ask you how much that car is worth? And are you allowed to sort of tell? You said you told it to me privately. You don't have to say it, but yeah. a qualified truck driver. There are certain qualifications you got to the highest level, but you can make some seriously good coin. Absolutely. If you have a clean criminal record, if you're not afraid of random urine tests. If you don't mind being electronically connected to your boss, meaning they know where you are and how fast you're driving at all times, and that freaks out a lot of truck drivers, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. But, and if you get, uh, you know, you have a decent driving record, you can easily make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year driving high-end items. And there, there is a driver that works in the company that I work for that's well over a quarter million dollars a year doing this. Wow. Yeah. What what's that car worth? That's a Ferrari, right? That is a very rare 1964 Ferrari 275 GTB, and I believe that sold at Barrett Jackson. That's where I picked it up, Barrett Jackson in Phoenix, for six point two million dollars. Woohoo! Don't scratch that, baby. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank goodness it's small. It fits in the truck really easy. That's amazing. So, what a pivot. It's, yeah. it's unusual, but it kind of, you connect the dots. You used to love driving truck when you were running that rig. Uh, you your, love collector cars, love car guys. You're making good coin. I'm doing good, uh, yeah. 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 Um, so let's pivot to the future. Yeah. Put on your uh, crystal ball. <laughs> sure. You know, we got the, the metaverse. Yes. And, and, and all kinds of stuff happening. W what do you see coming down the pipes? Well, I see that, of course, the current trend is it's very easy to get into photography. And a lot of people have picked up good quality cameras and have learned basic photography skills. And because they have that natural propensity to be able to create images, some of the family portrait work that's done here in Central Coast of California is gorgeous. And you're only paying $300 to get these beautiful pictures of your daughter outside on the beach. Mm -hmm. so, that takes a photographer like me with a lifetime worth of skills and it completely devaluates what I'm worth. Right. So I'm not going to get angry about it. I just, as you said, I, I don't have a problem pivoting and I'm enjoying the pivot. But I do see so many photographers, particularly my photographer friends that are volume shooters, that mm -hmm. that's kind of their big money, but they really love all the portraits and they love to do the wedding stuff. Mm -hmm. I see them unfortunately shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And slowly, uh, the, the big companies that own 50 different studios in certain regions there are going to get bigger. And the small guy is going to get pushed out. Um, I don't think that this, that's the end of small person photography. I think it's the photographers that develop those little niche, just like you did, Rob. Yeah. That figure out, hey, wait a minute. There's a little market for this. We can do this different. We can do this better. Mm -hmm. But Photographers from my generation used to work on their skills and say, this is what I do and hang out a shingle. Mm -hmm. Those days are done. Photographers have to learn how to maneuver through different marketing tools, social media, how they're going to photograph, what they're going to photograph. It's not static anymore. It was static with me, but it's not mm -hmm. static anymore. Mm -hmm. So I love to see photographers mess around with video. I'm all about the whole hybrid merge. There's, there's no difference between a non-moving picture and a moving picture. As we get closer and closer to everyone having screens, for instance, one of the projects I worked on that failed was, why are kids' school portraits not talking? <laughs> <laughs> my two-year-old, my son, when he was, well, when he was, my son was in second grade and had a tooth missing, yep. was the cutest little guy ever. Yeah. I want to be able to just see that photo and then I want to tap it and I want to hear him say, my favorite team is the Chicago Cubs or whatever he's going to say. Right. Because video holds more memory volume than photos can. Mm -hmm. And I want, because I have to pass the baton on. I tried to do that and I, the industry is too big. They fought against me. I got yeah. hammered way too hard by the, by the print industry and I understand it. Yeah. But there are beautiful, cool products coming down the line that this next gen of photographers has to jump on in order to raise the bar. It's mm -hmm. not the manufacturers that set what the photographers do. That's the old way. No, nope. mm -hmm. it's the photographers that are going to tell the manufacturers or, 
or startup companies, hey, we need an app to make a talking yearbook and not this electronic PDF crap yearbook stuff that the industry right. is trying to sell now. That's garbage. Who want? I, I got one of those from my niece. Oh, my God, it's terrible. And I know yeah, they right. a fortune for it. We need something that's intuitive, that looks very Apple-like that you flip through the pages and you press on a button. Where is that? So photographers, let me pass that baton. There's got to be a young Will Crockett out there. Go mm -hmm. to the bar and press the buttons and piss people off if you have to. But let's <laughs> get what you want. Think about what you want and then let's go. We can do that. That's Great. amazing. I would have never no. thought of that. And I I'm, get a lot of kids coming here doing school portraits all the time and grad pictures. I might have to put that to use and see if it works. Yeah. Yeah, I actually worked on a beautiful project that would auto edit photo and video clips with graphics in order to make a talking, oh, uh, uh, daycare, daycare card, talking daycare card. Nice. And it would have a photo and then it would have a video and a photo and a video. Mm -hmm. And then if the photographer shot them correctly, you could upload those and it would automatically edit them and spit them back out. Now, That's amazing. Know, thank you. I know it can be done because I did it. Yeah, I've seen it. It works. We just need to have somebody grab a hold of it and take it mainstream. We'll call it the Crockett. <laughs> I just the uh, uh, talking. Well, I think talkingportrait.com I still own. So nice. Don't do that. This, right? name. this is fascinating. And um, potentially you're onto something here and it's got a, an evolution cycle to go through. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but I'm taking what you're saying to heart because you've got a good track record and you've made predictions before and you plugged into them big time. So thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions. We've got to let you go soon because we're rolling around an hour. Um, okay. uh, one I, I wanna... one thing about, about predictions, if you want, you can go back on YouTube and you can see the first video I did about predicting mirrorless was going to take over. And you'll see the comment. This is like six, seven years ago. You'll see the comments that just, just hate, just a bunch of daggers. And then it stopped about four years ago. And then now you go, Will, how did you know that was going to happen so soon, Will? And, of course, we just said, why, here in this program? Well, I had inside knowledge. I knew it was going to happen. It influenced me, and I consider myself an early adopter, however. Um, I went 100% mirrorless Sony seven years ago. Right Never on. regretted it for a second. You still shoot Sony? Yeah, 100%. Yes, A7R2. I got two models and I have no reason to upgrade. It's so good. So I haven't done it yet, but I'm looking at it. I'm Canon shooter, so I'm still looking at the R5, the R6, and the um, even the new R3 that came out, but I can't afford that yet. They're very good, but I got to yep. tell you, at least from, from my guys that are shooting out in the field, big photographers, it's all Sony all day. Yeah. Yeah. There you go, so John. I might, have to, I might have to make the jump. You never know. Yeah. Sony yeah. is the new Canon. <laughs> all right. I got to ask you two quick questions, Will. Uh, yes, sir. Totally off topic. Your dad was in World War II. Uh, Korea. Oh, okay. Yep. I'm a history buff, big time World War II buff. Yep. My mom so. was uh, a British citizen. She was never a U.S. citizen, but she was around World War II. Uh -huh. And in fact, I believe somewhere around is her gas mask that has little elephant ears and a little elephant trunk on it. Because cool. the, the city used to, of London used to give out to little kids so they wouldn't be scared. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So you're a, you're an illegal immigrant because your mom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not an American. <laughs> you, you better get on that. Uh, okay, my next question is yeah. a little bit political, current to the times. Yeah. Nothing much to do sure. with photography, but a little bit to do with the fact that you're now a trucker. A so truck let's. Driver. Yeah, truck driver, big difference, and. Yeah. Uh, so you know what's going on in Canada right now. It's absolutely crazy. I'm seeing uh, it every day. The Freedom Rally and the world is following it. Uh, I'm excited about it. I, I was at first thinking, nah, this is just going to boom, boom. But I was Me excited too. that, okay, they're doing something. Because I am 100% against mandates, lockdowns, yep. and masks. I hate all three. Yep. I think they're yep. evil. So yep. what are your thoughts on that? If we can get a little bit into a heated, yep. controversial subject. For no, 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 no. It's all respectful. Uh, I am fully vaccinated. I've had COVID once, maybe twice. Don't know for sure. Um, I support people's rights to take the vax or not take the vax. It's completely mm -hmm. up to them. And I will help protect their rights to do that. The truckers, 
God bless them for doing what they're doing. I, I hate having to strike anything, particularly when you're talking about reducing food to the population, and particularly in the winter time. But it's a powerful mm-hmm. statement that they made, and I am so disappointed that Trudeau did what he did. Mm-hmm. I think he's cowardice. I think that he's a bright young man, and I'm just so confused about my Canadian neighbors, whom I've always loved my entire life. Mm-hmm. How the heck did we put that guy? How did you put that guy in office if he makes these kind of decisions? Mm-hmm. He's got and great hair. He's, yeah, he does. Well, he dyes his hair, which is kind of weird for me. So <laughs> that's kind of funny. I thought the news the other day when police were actually ordered to confiscate the fuel that yep. the Canadians were giving to donate to the truckers because that's heat. What's what's the temperature in Ottawa right now? It well at the time when they were doing that, you're looking about minus probably it was at like minus fifteen to minus twenty Celsius. For, that is Arctic weather. It is. Yeah. And they and, need fuel in order to have the heat on. That's how the heat works in the truck. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. That is it's very disappointing. I would love to see the, the Canadian government sit down and just have a conversation either on camera or off camera. Just listen to their grievances because they got a point. Yeah. Now, will that happen here in America? Probably not. Truckers will not get vaccinated if they don't want to be vaccinated. Would they all join together for a strike? Probably not, because a lot of the truckers that I'm meeting are still driving like mad because we're behind because of the COVID stuff. Right. And of course, anything can happen at any time. I may be wrong with that, but it's it's really disappointing. What's your thoughts on it? Well, I'm buying Mine. them all the way. They went, actually went by. Ten, where they drove by to go to Ottawa was 10 minutes down the road from where I live yeah. right now. So Good. Did you go see them? No, I didn't get a chance. I was actually in a different situation at the time, so I never got a chance to go see them. But it was droves out there. They yeah. actually used one of our... Um, truck stops area is about 15, actually 10 minutes from my studio right now as one of their places where they pulled in to gas up and get some food and there things like go. that. Nice, so. nice. I'm hopeful. I uh, I can't stand uh, the echo chamber that is the mainstream media. I talk to people who always 100% just plug into CNN and our local CTV uh, national yeah. and CBC. Yeah. And and that's all they know. That's all they know is what they hear, and they hear Trudeau yeah. say stuff like uh, they're misogynists and racists. I mean, how that's like a fourteen-year-old, uh, grade nine student who's vindictive and angry and petty. And yeah. uh, mm-hmm. there's much more to it. So I'm I'm hopeful that uh, you know it blows me away that the rest of the world is like, look at Canada. This yeah. is amazing because we never get that, and that's it's right. happening. And uh, so I think it may be the catalyst to something else. Uh, they're trying to get the cops and the army involved. And I'm kind of like thinking in the back oh. of my brain, well, wouldn't it be cool if all the cops in the army says, screw it. Oh. Yeah, they've pulling. also got local uh, tow truck drivers that will not go and take the trucks away, even though they've been told they they're trying to hire them and none of them will yeah. go and do it. Okay. And on top of that, it's helped a little bit because there's two provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, which to the United States would be like states, basically. Yeah. And they've already said that they're dropping their mandates as of like this date or that day, and their mandates are going down. So, oh, good. So, it's so now we'll have to see what the other part of the country does and what Ontario is going to do. Wow. Yeah. So that's yeah. that. The, the mask mandate thing is just silly. And, yeah. of course, uh, I and the vaccine that. passport is is ridiculous, too. Yeah, but. I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. But we won't get into that. So. Yeah. Well, I live in California, and of course, uh, Central California is uh, home to the, the, you know, the folks on the other side, which is fine. I get along with everybody, mm-hmm. but I have been scolded for not wearing a mask in the post office, not by the people who work at the post office, but by my other uh, uh, fellow citizens. Yep. But this is also the place that I've been yelled at twice for holding the door open for a lady. <laughs> Says it all. Chivalry doesn't pay sometimes. Santa Monica, California. I grab a this individual had one arm kind of full of stuff. I went and grabbed the door real quick. I go, there you go. Just that's my that's my normal. Yeah. And I got it both barrels. Got the. Yep. How dare you? Yeah. How dare you? But as long as it doesn't change who you are, not everybody's going to be happy with what you do. But there will be people that will. So don't let it change who you are. Not at all, guys. This was been. So Thank much you. fun. What a Thank great you. time. I feel like we're just hanging out having coffee. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Very much. I, uh, 
I just wanted to tell you, thank you very much. And you've done an outstanding job making me sound quasi interesting because I'm so. <laughs> Because you are, you got a lot to say, and we appreciate you coming on and sharing your information. So exactly, your story. There's a there's a wealth of uh, stuff there for anybody at any level in or phase in life to uh, pick up on, uh, including yeah. myself, an old timer like me, and or the new guy. If you're young, if you're in your twenties, you know, when you're uh, looking at photography, man, I'm telling you, the the message. There's nothing new under the sun. No. It's the same shit. That's right. Yeah. Just do it, man. Just yeah. listen to what Will has to say and practice it. And yeah. go check out his Shoot Smarter YouTube channel. Yeah, go channel. check the Shoot Smarter for sure. Because all the information might be 10, 15 years old in there, but it's still relevant today. And that's what matters. Oh, yeah. In fact, on the Shoot Smarter YouTube channel, I did a bunch of videos over the COVID break. So there's some fresh ones on there, too. Oh, cool. yeah. People are interested. Amazing. All right. Thanks, Will. Much appreciate having you. Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. All, all right. right.